Don't lock out, bro. It's bad for your gains. Length and partials have been getting a boatload of attention over the last year, and it seems only over the last year. This wasn't a concept until about December, maybe midsummer last year. Naturally, I had to dive in and see what all the fuss was about. But instead of going through the endless studies, because who has time for that, I decided to go on a whim and take advice from some pretty pretty smart people who recommended it and thought, well, what the heck? Up to this point, I've only gotten sore on movements that have given a stretchy focus in my training. So let's just let's just do the stretch. So for the last probably four months now, I've focused solely on length and partials for every single exercise I have done in my training. Everything. And this isn't about debunking research. This is just a real unfiltered account of my experience of the last few months. I'm going to walk you through some things to be aware of, some benefits, some possible disadvantages, but too long don't read. Generally speaking, they are worth it. So I'll start with something to be aware of. I'm not going to say the bad. This is just something to be aware of. On certain exercises, especially back exercises, it seems, it is pretty tough to measure exactly what a suitable consistent range of motion is. It felt like, especially on things like pull-ups, that the toughest part of the movement was sometimes, shall we say, being skipped. Because on a pull-up, for me, it's about the mid-range, the top range of the movement. So if I'm only going to do the bottom range, I'm kind of just flailing around and it looks a bit silly. On a machine row or a cable row or a one-arm cable row, one of my favorite movements, you don't exactly know how far back to pull the elbow. On certain movements, you can have a pretty good guesstimate based on visually literally seeing how far your hand comes up relative to a part of the body. Say you're on an incline curl and you're doing lengthened partials, then I only pull my hands to my hip, just to the side of me. But on back movements, it is pretty tricky to work around. That said, I would say that the best thing to do is to just practice. Practice feeling where a lengthened partial range of motion is. I mean, let's just say that a lengthened partial is the bottom one third of the range of motion. Do a full rep and then do one third of that and then just film yourself. Are you doing one third of the range of motion consistently? You can see that on camera. This is why you should film your workouts, by the way. So, again, I would say with this, it, it comes with practice. I had to also work around this on things like leg press and leg movements, which we'll get onto a bit. But that was more a performance consideration than a range of motion consideration, which we'll go on to next, but it's kind of kind of kind of linked together. So of course there are some practical challenges. On certain machines the weight just isn't heavy enough. I max out the back most leg curl machines, most back machines. I don't max out anything on dumbbells or chest machines. But yeah, I would say anything. I mean, I've, look, I've got a pretty good back anyway, so I'm, I wasn't far off. I mean, I, I was maxing out machines when I was doing full range of motion anyway, but this was particularly prevalent when now I'm, I'm doing all lengthened partials. I find myself doing unilateral movements and using machines, which, should we say, are maybe, maybe things that are plate loaded, so you can just load on more plates. But yes, certainly since going to length and partials, I mean, take leg extensions, for example, great for full range reps, but not so much for partials where I feel like I need more resistance at the bottom sometimes because a leg extension sometimes doesn't actually get the full stretch on the quad. And sometimes I feel more burn in the rec fem when I'm doing full range of motion. So I would say that some movements don't even feel as stimulating you don't get that much pump you don't it, it, it can be hard to distinguish between if the, you're targeting the muscle or something else that's assisting because the rep is so heavy sometimes it's tough 
it takes practice. I'm not going to pretend that it can't be worked around, but I'm not going to pretend like they're perfect either. Dumbbells are another issue for some people. Uh, my gym has a really high dumbbell cap. It's something insane, like 150 kilograms. But sometimes you still have to practice and get creative with how you set up the dumbbells, especially with things like failing safely on dumbbell movements when the well, the weight is a little bit heavier. And I think I've I've kind of ragged on the the most serious pitfalls up to this point. I'd like to touch on the benefits. So the one of the upsides is length and partials forces you to train in a rep range where the joints are flex, which creates a sort of blood flow restriction effect. And I don't think this has been talked about at all enough, at least. This means that even with lighter weights, your muscles feel worked to their muscle to their, sorry, their maximum capacity. One of the most surprising benefits is that you reach full muscle failure abruptly and consistently across sets and workouts. This is because you're not able to rest at the top of the movement during length and partials, obviously, when the joints are extended, allowing you to push yourself harder without the same level of systemic fatigue because you're essentially not rest forcing, so so it's called. Because an example classic example on things like hack squats or leg movements just normal standing barbell squats between each rep it might go half a second of rest and then 0.6 seconds of rest and then 0.7 seconds of rest and then by the 12th rep you're taking three or four seconds between each rep that goes for hack squats or any other movements really but particularly legs whereas on something like a length and partial on something like a hack squat there's no rest at the top as soon as you come halfway, or so we say a third of the way up the movement, you're going back down again. And I found that this is awesome for general fatigue management. Now, for the particularly good stuff, length and partials seem to have a unique application to targeting muscle fibers that might not get as much as attention in full range movements. So, for instance, doing heavy partials on cable lateral raises allowed me to hit my side delts in a way that regular overhead presses just can't match. The constant tension in the stretched position was something that I did and still do experience massively. And across the board, purely because of the mind-muscle connection and because of the position that you're putting your muscles in, this is awesome because you take advantage of the stretch. Lengthened partials can be used for stre both stretchy and pump focus movements, but generally I love them for stretchy movements. And I suppose on closing, the good is that lengthened partials train you to be exceptionally mobile. Exceptionally mobile in every movement that you do. You are training the end range of a movement and only the end range. So by God, your knees, I suppose ankles, hips, shoulders, elbows, they get used to the end range of motion fast. And from our understanding of mobility and protecting the joints, training that end range joint movement is awesome so I, now I, I totally appreciate that you get this anyway with full range of motion training and if you do the full movement of something you're going to get the full flexion and extension of the joint etc etc totally get that however if i do if i'm doing more reps per year with potentially a heavier weight in the flexed position I'm going to have better mobility than someone who does full range of motion with possibly less weight. Right? I mean, tell me if that's reverse engineering. But all I can say is that I am now more comfortable than ever in my training from a mobility standpoint. So, after a few months of exclusively doing length and partials, well, the results were... I would like to say very good and the results are showing because well physically 
I'm in some of the best. You know, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in, and I think the only drawback potentially could be the psychological drawback of being unable to do full range of motion because maybe you feel a bit silly, you feel embarrassed in the gym, you think, am I am I doing this properly? Am I ego lifting? And look. As long as you are, it's all about SF, the stimulus to fatigue at the end of the day, stimulus to fatigue ratio. You are doing it properly if you're getting a killer stimulus with lower fatigue, first and foremost. And you're consistently progressively overloading all the signs of soreness and, let's say, progressive overload are there. And you know, who cares what other people think, really? And of course, safety is crucial for long term progress. So, that is also a consideration with length and partials. Please set up your safety equipment in the gym. Use, use the safeties just like you normally would on full range of motion exercises. Take the bottom end range slow, like a, at least a two second eccentric. And you guys are going to have some wicked mobility and wicked gains. So, that's my logic behind using lengthened partials. That's my honest experience and some tidbits of what you guys would need to apply to your training if you're going to get the most out of them. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you got some value from this video and I will catch up with you in the next upload. Peace.